Okay, so in uh, the last lecture, we started looking at, uh, um, at how to place some um, flat theory, supersymmetric field theory in flat space on uh, curved superspace preserving uh, supersymmetry. So what uh, the procedure that uh, outlined last time was that of uh, coupling your supersymmetric uh, field theory to supergravity. And uh, then uh, to freeze the uh, supergravity fluctuations by sending the Planck mass to infinity and uh, setting the supergravity fields to classical background values. Uh, and then uh, we said that uh, the conditions for this uh, uh, backgrounds to preserve some uh, amount of supersymmetry uh, are encoded in uh, just uh, requiring that the variations of uh, the background are zero. And uh, this uh, give rise to some differential equations for the spin or variation parameters that uh, go under the name of generalized uh, killing spin or equations. So this comes from setting the variation of, uh, say, the Gravitini to be equal to zero. <coughs> um, OK, so now we also like introduced some one example, which was uh, for theories which, uh, uh, for n equal one theories in four dimensions, which possess a Ferrara Zumino supercurrent multiplet. Then we can couple them to what is called old minimal supergravity. And uh, this uh, generalized killing spinor equations that you get in this particular instance uh, have the following form. I'm only going to write one. There is another one for theta bar. And uh, here in this equation, uh, M is a complex uh, background field in the supergravity multiplet, and B mu is uh, a complex one for, uh, sorry, a real one form uh, in, or well, you can make it complex in the, uh, again, in the gravity multiplet. And uh, the other way in which the fields in the gravity multiplet appear uh, in this equation, well, I mean, they appear implicitly in the sigma mu's uh, because there will be factor of the frame and also in the covariant derivatives and in the spin connection, which enter in the covariant derivative acting on the spinner. <coughs> okay, so then uh, in order to find backgrounds which preserve some supersymmetry, you have to find backgrounds for which uh, you can find solutions to this equation and the uh, other one for zeta bar. So M, M was a scalar? Yeah, M is a scalar, uh, and the B mu is a one form. So, for instance, uh, we can uh, I can give an example. Uh, so, uh, we can set B mu to zero, and uh, we can take the metric. We can take the manifold to be the four sphere, and uh, we can take the metric to be round uh, with radius r. And then uh, we can uh, try to see if we can so solve this, uh, this equation for some value of m. And well, and the other equation which will have uh, an m bar. So maybe we can just write the other equation 
here suppressing the piece with B. Uh, and indeed, uh, you will find out that uh, there is, uh, your, so this was one of the exercises, so if you have done it, you have found out uh, that uh, there are uh, four solutions to this coupled equations, which means that you have four uh, different uh, couples of z and z bar. that uh, solve this equation for b mu equals 0 and you have to set m equals m bar equals 3i over r. So this is indeed uh, one of those cases in which you have to allow the uh, background fields uh, to be complex uh, and in particular m and m bar are not related by complex conjugation uh, because they both have uh, the plus i. <coughs> Okay, so, uh, well, then you can figure out, once you have the, uh, the spinor variation parameters, uh, you can uh, check what the algebra is, and what you find is that, uh, uh, in this case, you get OSP1 slash 4. Um, and indeed, in OSP1 slash 4, uh, you have uh, an SO5, or, well, SP4, corresponding to the rotations uh, on the S4, and uh, there is no R symmetry. Um, okay, so then uh, you can, so le let's comment a little bit about this, uh, this, uh, this, this background that I have to turn on. So uh, if you remember the expression for the deformation of the flat space Lagrangian that uh, I wrote down last time, or if you open like uh, Wessenberger and check the uh, equations for uh, old minimal supergravity coupled to matter, uh, then uh, you will see that this, uh, uh, this M and M bar coupled to certain uh, operator appear in the Lagrangian is coupling to some certain operator which appears in the current multiplet. So this was this operator X uh, that uh, uh, we talked about, and this operator uh, if the theory uh, is not super conformal, uh, will uh, not be zero. Uh, and therefore, there will be terms in the Lagrangian which uh, have uh, funny factors of i, uh, which couple to this, uh, to this operator. And uh, all these terms will go down as 1 over r, as uh, advertised, uh, advertised last time. <coughs> now, one thing which is uh, uh, interesting is that if you, uh, so these terms which like somehow spoil uh, reflection positivity on S4 uh, because of the funny reality condition on the, on the background fields, they go away uh, when this uh, operator X uh, vanishes. And that indeed, as we discussed, uh, happens when you can shorten the multiplet from the ferrara zumino multiplet to the super conformal one. So for superconformal field theories, these terms are not present. And indeed, like you know, that you can place a theory on uh, the four sphere uh, without having to add any one over R terms in the Lagrangian by just uh, doing a conformal map. So that will introduce a coupling to the uh, curvature, which goes like one over R squared, but it does not introduce any uh, imaginary uh, couplings. Um, and this, uh, by the way, also, uh, well, so, 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 so you might have wondered um, why is that uh, I can write down, people write down theories on, on spheres and uh, they are uh, supersymmetric uh, for like, say, some non-conformal n equal to uh, theory on S4, or in this case, a non-conformal n equal 1 theory. Um, but uh, no one has ever written down anything in the sitter. So the sitter is supposed not to be supersymmetric. And uh, the reason is that, indeed, like you could imagine doing the sitter, but then you would have some uh, background fields which are 
uh, imaginary in Lorentzian signature, and like uh, that will correspond to some theory which is not unitary, and people are not interested in theories which are not unitary. No, not interested in writing no unitary theory in the sitter, so that I guess <coughs> is why you don't see this. Um, okay, so this is uh, uh, concludes the comments that I wanted to make for now about uh, the uh, old minimal, um, the old minimal supergravity um, background. Uh, I will maybe come back to this. Uh, the end of the next lecture. Okay, so but I, I wanted to make a general comment before continuing, which uh, I think is a, is a good slogan, um, which is the following. Uh, so we we had this diagram uh, last uh, last time. I drew this diagram where we have like a set of. Uh, uh, this is like the set of all n equal one theories, and all of these theories we argued have a supercurrent multiplet that we call the S multiplet. And then inside this, there are like some more special theories, which um, will uh, have a Ferrara Zumino supercurrent multiplet, and some other set of theory which have a conserved R symmetry, so they have this R multiplet. And then in the intersection, there is an even more special set of theory which uh, are super conformal. Uh, now, so first a question that I got by a few of you, so maybe I should clarify, is that indeed this is a proper subset. So there are theories which have both a Ferrara Zumino supercurrent and an arc current, uh, but are not super conformal. So that means that you do have improvements uh, available that make the S multiplet both an FZ multiplet or an R multiplet, but the improvement for the R multiplet and the FZ multiplet are not the same. So you cannot set, uh, you cannot improve all the component of the supercurrent multiplet S that will ne be needed to be improved to zero in order to get an SCFT at the same time. So the simplest example of such a theory is just the free chiral field with mass. Now that's clearly not a super conformal field theory, but uh, it has uh, an R symmetry, and uh, it also you can check have a Ferrara Zumino supercurrent. Yes. Will any mass deformation of an SCFT be both FC and R? Uh, will any mass deformation of uh, so you take an SCFT and just add some masses? Yes. Uh, well, no, because that will presumably break R. Uh -huh. So. I don't think that's true. <laughs> so, um, okay. Twisted masses are for two dimensions. There was a comment about. Yeah, I'm not sure what the comment exactly refers to. Um, but, uh, okay, so let me. So the, the slogan that I wanted uh, that I wanted to say is that uh, uh, is the following: basically, the more special a theory is, the more backgrounds it can be placed on, uh, which I think is, uh, I mean, it does not require an explanation uh, because if a theory is more sp so a theory which has an R multiplet has clearly also an S multiplet. Therefore, it should be if you solve the conditions for having supersymmetry stemming from 16, 16 supergravity, clearly any theory which has an S multiplet, which is any n equal one theory, can be placed supersymmetrically on this background. So in particular, the theories which have an R multiplet. So that means that there is a dual, if you want, of this diagram, which uh, like uh, are uh, all the background on which you can put a super conformal field theory. Uh, this is the most special class of theory, so they have the biggest uh, set of backgrounds on which they can be placed, preserving some supersymmetry. And then inside this, there will be a smaller subset for the theories which have an FC multiplet, and a smaller subset for the theories which never are multiplet. And there is going to be an intersection, and in, in this intersection, like, uh, well, there, like, there will be the theories which only have an S multiplet. So actually, uh, even if naively you would think 
that uh, the equations that you get uh, to find supersymmetric backgrounds stemming from 1616 supergravity should have more solutions, just because there are more background fields that you can play with. Actually, they do have less. And this comes because of this general <coughs> argument. Um, so you don't need to solve equations to get to this conclusion. Uh, so any question? OK, so if not, uh, I will uh, continue by uh, talking about um, theories which, uh, instead of possessing an FC multiplet, possess an R multiplet. And this is the case that we are, we are going to spend the most of our time on, uh, mainly because it's actually the one where the classification of supersymmetric backgrounds is more uniform and nicer. So you can repeat this classification also for theories with an FC multiplet, but it's uh, more, there are more subcases and it's uh, a little bit more complicated and not as interesting. So, okay, so where is this? So again, uh, I will remind you that, uh, so we consider theories with an R symmetry. So our supercurrent multiplet uh, contains uh, well, the energy momentum tensor, uh, the supercurrent, and uh, it also contains as its bottom component the conserved R symmetry current, J mu. And then, uh, as uh, we have seen, it also contains some um, uh, string current, C mu nu, or which, well, which is the dual of some closed two form. OK. Um, and uh, so this multiplet can be coupled to a version of minimal supergravity called new minimal supergravity. Um, OK, so let me write here the string current, which is proportional to the dual of f. <coughs> so this is automatically conserved, because f is closed. And uh, so what are the fields in the min new minimum supergravity? Well, there is going to be the metric. Uh, well, gravitinos. And then uh, there is going to be an auxiliary field, uh, which is a connection for the U1 uh, R symmetry. And uh, we will call this field A mu. So this is a background gauge field, so it has a gauge invariance. And then uh, we will also have uh, another background gauge field, which is uh, which is a <coughs> which is a two form. And uh, how do they call it in my notes? B maybe? Yes. And uh, again, so this is a gauge. Uh, it's, it has also some gauge invariance. B mu nu plus B mu omega nu minus nu. And, uh, <coughs> and this, uh, uh, this two form couples to the, to the conserved uh, string current. So indeed, the the coupling of B mu and C mu will be gauge invariant because C mu is conserved. Uh, alternatively, uh, in uh, actually most of uh, the what I'm going to say, I'm not going to use this uh, uh, two-form gauge field, but I will instead 
uh, consider the dual of its field strength, which I'm going to call V mu. So that's going to be so by its by its definition, uh, it's conserved. So this is. satisfies a conservation equation. <coughs> okay, so these are uh, the fields in the, uh, well, oh, and, and plus fermions. I mean, do, there will be, there will be gravitinos uh, that couples to the super current. Okay. <coughs> oh, I already put it there. Okay, okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yes. <coughs> Good. Uh, okay, so to continue, I have to say that I mean I'm gonna make a switch of uh, so of reference because I discovered that I wrote my notes actually using the conventions of a different paper than the one I gave last time. So actually, the conventions for what I'm going to write now come from uh, 1407-2598 uh, by Cyril Closet, uh, Thomas Dumitrescu, uh, Zor Komargowski, uh, plus myself. <coughs> okay, so let's write down what these uh, generalized killing spinner equations are for the case of uh, new minimal supergravity, which I think will also make it uh, clear why uh, these are like nicer than the ones that I wrote over there. So <coughs> we have an equation for d mu zeta. And uh, this again has the same structure as advertised in general, so it will be some covalent derivative of the spinner is equal to some uh, object which is linear uh, in the spinner uh, and its complex and and zeta bar. Um, okay, but now I'm, I'm going to write it in a better way. Minus i over two, d nu sigma mu uh, sigma. Okay. In, in the following, I'll try to be uh, to use tildes instead of uh, instead of bars because in Euclidean signature, the uh, dotted spinners are not related. Uh, to the undotted spinner by complex conjugation. So I will emphasize that by using tilde instead of bar. Um, so this is one equation. And uh, then there is another equation for the uh, right-handed spinner, zeta tilde. OK, so here they are. So let's uh, make some comments. So first of all, from this, you see that uh, the spinner zeta and zeta tilde, uh, they are not just spinner, but uh, they also have U1 U1 R charges. So they actually uh, live in the U1 R uh, line bundle times the spin bundle. So these are left-handed spinner with charge 1 under they are symmetry, and these are right-handed spinner with charge minus one um, under the R symmetry. And uh, in particular, uh, this uh, um, the, the uh, charge spinner uh, can exist on uh, any spin C manifold, so you don't even need your manifold to be spin for this uh, these objects to be in principle well defined. <coughs> And uh, in four dimension, a, any orientable manifold is spin C, so that um, is nice. 
Uh, so that was comment number one. So zeta and zeta tilde uh, have our charges. And uh, correspondingly, the supercharges which correspond to the zetas and the zeta tildes will be, will like, uh, so there will be, we, we know that there is an R symmetry and this R symmetry acts on the supercharges. Uh, okay, so that's uh, uh, first comment. Um, the other comment uh, is that uh, with respect to the equation that I brought there in old minimal, you can see that uh, uh, here uh, zeta uh, it appears by itself. There is no zeta tilde in the first equation and vice versa, there is no zeta in the second equation. And uh, so that makes uh, things nicer. <coughs> uh, if you want, this is also due to the fact that uh, None of the fields, uh, well, except for the gravitino, but uh, the, 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 the bosonic field in the supergravity multiplet are not our charge, so there, there is no way of writing something here which would involve zeta tilde. <coughs> um, okay, so then other comments is that uh, I already made, but uh, they are worth stressing, is that uh, uh, in Euclidean space, zeta and zeta tilde are not related by complex conjugation. Um, that and uh, the other comment, uh, so in particular, there is no real good reason uh, to say that a mu and v mu have to be real. Uh, now you as we will see, we actually, so a mu is a, is a connection, so it doesn't, it's not just a well-defined one form. So in all the examples that we have, like uh, the, um, the imaginary part of a mu will be a well-defined a one form, and like uh, the, it's only in the real part, which is not. Uh, and hence, basically, we, in all the examples that we have, like we always only have to do um, real, U1 R gauge transformations in going from patch to patch. We don't have to do, uh, we don't have to invoke complexified um, UNR gauge transformations. Um, and uh, the other comment which I've made yesterday, but I repeat, is that uh, uh, because we are considering some fixed uh, background, uh, V mu, it's all the auxiliary fields in the supergravity, namely V mu and A mu. Uh, don't need to satisfy equation of motion. Okay. <coughs> so is there any question so far? Uh, does this theory also uh, break the passive reflection stuff, uh, similar to the particle? This th which theory? The, the one with R macro. I mean, if you have a background with, uh, yeah, so uh, that depends on the specific background, uh, then... Do you consider the round sphere similar to that? No, the round sphere cannot be, op is not in the in this class of backgrounds that, so there will be no round sphere solution to these equations. Uh, yes. So if, if it's not spin, then do you have to choose the twisted, uh, or a twisted bundle where the R charges load appropriately so that when you can Yes. It, okay. It's, uh, it has to be, yeah, so the- Zeta lives in an honest bundle. Yeah. Uh, some other question? No. Okay, so let's uh, find another blackboard here. Okay, so now that, uh, uh, so the other comment that we can make is that uh, from the supergravity, uh, from the, the way that supercharges act in supergravity, you can, uh, well, sorry, from the supergravity transformation, 
from the algebra of the supergravity variations, you can find out what will be the algebra <coughs> of the supersymmetry variations that remain. So suppose you have some solutions to these equations, then like uh, you can start varying the fields using this uh, spin of variations parameter z and zeta tilde and uh, commute this variation and find what algebra do they realize. And uh, so we can write down what that will be. So suppose that I have some variation which is parameterized by a solution zeta and uh, some other one which is parameterized by, uh, well, first let's do another zeta. So let's say zeta prime. Uh, then uh, you find out that uh, this commute. And uh, well, similarly for two zeta tildes. And uh, if you have one delta zeta and one delta zeta tilde, then on the other side, uh, well, and let's suppose that you act on some field phi uh, of r charge r. So this is any field that you want. Then this is going to be qi times the d derivative along a certain uh, vector field k uh, with a prime. I'm going to explain what the prime means of phi r. Uh, so first of all, what is k? Our k is what you would imagine. It's uh, zeta sigma mu zeta tilde. And uh, you can actually check for your uh, for your edification that uh, indeed uh, if uh, zeta and zeta tilde satisfy those equations for some v and a then this vector is killing so this is uh, an is, is a translation along some isometry uh, of the manifold <coughs> and uh, uh, then i have to still explain what this prime means so the prime is there because the lead derivative is uh, twisted by the U1R gauge field. Um, so that means that uh, the D derivative prime K of some field phi of R charge R uh, is equal to uh, the usual D derivative. Uh, but then there is a piece which is just what you would imagine uh, times phi R. But not quite, because, because of the convention I'm following here, there is also 3 half of v mu. OK, this is, not, uh, this is just a question of definitions, because you could always redefine the UNR gauge field by absorbing a factor of minus 3 half of v mu. v mu is a well-defined one form, so there is no problem. Times, uh, times what? K. K. No, that's v. It's the other background field. The conserved uh, vector. The oh, the indices. Oh, oh, times. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> yes, that's uh, obviously has to be there. Um, great. Uh, so again, this I mean you can expect, and actually, uh, it's not just that. I mean, if uh, my fields are charged under some gauge group, uh, then. Uh, on the right hand side, there could be uh, appropriate gauge transformations uh, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So, okay, good. So now we can uh, write down what uh, the Lagrangian of some theory would look like. So, wha what is the coupling of uh, some flat space theory to, some to this background? So again, so if you start with some theory with some Lagrangian, then in order to find the Lagrangian of the theory in some supergravity background, so either you open your supergravity book, uh, well, that's what you have to do, and then just look at how this thing is made. But uh, I will just make some comments. So the, you can divide this into three pieces. The first one is just uh, the original flat space Lagrangian minimally coupled to the metric. Then there is uh, a second set of terms, which we'll call L1. Uh, so these uh, include uh, couplings uh, of, the, uh, uh, of various operators in the R current multiplet to, the, to V mu and A mu. 
So again, so what, what can this be? So this will be, in particular, uh, there will be a coupling of the conserved R symmetry to the uh, R gauge field A mu. And then there is also a coupling, as we discussed, of the um, of this uh, gauge field B gauge form B mu nu to the conserved string current C mu nu. Uh, or alternatively, uh, we could write this as uh, this uh, field V mu, uh, which is conserved, uh, which couples to some connection giving rise to C mu. So this, uh, this twiddled A mu does not have to be well defined. It could shift by D mu of something, but because V mu is conserved, it's not a problem. Okay, then finally, there are Siegel terms, and uh, this we call L2, and these include couplings to curvature. and also to uh, products of two of these auxiliary fields. Right. So this is consistent with dimensional analysis, where you find that uh, the background gauge field V and A, uh, or uh, B and A, have uh, dimension one. So they scale like one over R, where R is some overall scale. Uh, of, uh, of your manifold, overall radius, uh, while the curvature scales like 1 over r squared. <coughs> okay, so I, I I'm actually going to write down some explicit Lagrangian so that you can see this actually uh, borne out in practice. Uh, okay, so indeed, let's, uh, let's write down um, an example. What did I have here? Oh, yes, I can get rid of this. OK, so let's consider uh, chiral fields. Let's consider a chiral field of charge chiral field. Uh, with R charge R. Okay, this might be confusing if I also use R for the size of the manifold, but it shouldn't be a big deal. Um, well, I could call this Q. I don't like that. Keep it R. Uh, so, uh, so we can write down what the supersymmetry variations will be uh, in some putative background. So the, so the chiral field, again, this should be known that there is a complex scalar phi, uh, a valve fermion psi, and uh, an auxiliary field f, which is again a complex scalar. And uh, the variations are going to be so delta z of phi is square root of 2 times uh, z of psi. So that's it does exactly have the same form as in flat space. And uh, indeed, you sh could have guessed this because it doesn't involve any derivatives. Then we have uh, delta psi, delta z of psi. So this is uh, square root of 2. zeta times f. Again, this is the same as in flat space. And then you have uh, I am clearly missing some
Okay, so there is this, where well, this covariant derivatives means that the derivative is covariantized with respect to the UNR gauge field, but actually to be more exact, uh, d mu of uh, some field phi with r charge r is, uh, well, you know what it's going to be. It's going to be the same as I brought somewhere else, I guess. Well, it disappeared. Anyway, it's... Uh, going to be the covariant derivative times uh, minus i r uh, v mu and was it pl yeah, plus 3 halves no a mu plus 3 half v mu um, times phi so there is a reason actually why this particular choice has been made and uh, that's because uh, this a is actually the uh, field which couples to the, um, so if the theory were super conformal, then that field will couple to the super conformal R symmetry. <coughs> okay, so that's the, so you get this extra piece. So here you see that there is some deformation of the, uh, of the variations in flat space, and that's just obtained by covariantizing the derivatives with respect to the UNR connection. And uh, finally, uh, we have to write down the variation of f. And uh, uh, this is going to be, so this is actually somewhat different than the one, um, this I can write d mu of uh, zeta tilde sigma tilde mu. Okay, so here you see again that uh, there are like uh, several differences with respect to the one in flat space. Uh, first of all, well, the derivatives are covariantized, but then here when you expand this, you also get a factor where the covariant derivative acts on the, on the spinner. And then if you want to be explicit, you will have to replace the, this using the equation over there and then you will get a bunch of terms. Okay, so the variations are modified with respect to the one in flat space, but again, the modification uh, dies off as the radius of the manifold becomes uh, larger and larger because the fields uh, A mu and V mu uh, scale like one over the radius of the manifold. Except, should you have another question on the formality transformation? Sorry, should I have what? Correction to the variation of the formula. No, that's, that's it. The correction is inside the covariant derivative. Uh, okay, any more questions? Is there an intuition for why the zeta tilde has to be inside in the variation of f but not in the... No, this is just, okay, this is just that it's particularly nice to write it that way, but no I, I don't have an intuition why that happens. Uh, uh, m maybe somebody can come up with this, but it's, uh <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, but but it, it is true that uh, this is nice. Uh, uh, but uh, you could just, yeah, I could have written the more complicated one. Uh, okay, so now let's see some example of some supersymmetric Lagrangian. Um, so for instance, we can take you have already set to zero the gravity, right? Yes, yes. Th this is assuming that there is a solution to those equations. Then, then this would be the supersymmetry variation in the background corresponding to this solution. Um, okay, so our Lagrangian will be... I here have to be a little bit careful because I made a little bit of a mess in my notes. Mm. 
And then uh, we have uh, the usual term with the auxiliary fields. I could have put these two last pieces together, but uh, okay, so this should be it. So uh, let, let's make some comments. So first of all, this has the general structure advertised some, is it here? Yeah, okay. So there are terms which are just uh, the minimal coupling to gravity. Then there are terms of order one over R, which include the coupling uh, of the auxiliary fields in the supergravity multiplet to various currents uh, in the in the theory, so in particular from this Lagrangian you can read off uh, what is the uh, operator which couples to V mu and uh, the well, what is the conserved R current. I guess that's not particularly interesting. And check that that is indeed what you get from the R multiplet for a chiral for a free chiral field. Um, and uh, then there are terms of order one over R squared, uh, which uh, depend on curvature and on the uh, on squares of the auxiliary fields, and uh, notice that this all these terms do depend on the value of the R charge. So the the formation of the theory does depend on the R charge of the field that uh, that you are considering. So now one thing that you can notice uh, is that uh, let's suppose that uh, we consider some uh, the, the value of the R charge which corresponds. To, well, the super conformal value of the R charge, which is uh, two thirds. Right? If, if the R charge of a chiral field is equal to two thirds, then you can have a cubic superpotential. Um, uh, then we can check that uh, indeed. Uh, this uh, will just uh, correspond to uh, do the conformal coupling. Uh, so let's, uh, let's see if that's indeed correct. Well, if r is equal to two-thirds, this term disappears. So this goes away. Uh, then this term becomes r over 6, which is indeed the conformally the value of the uh, cu coupling to the Ricci scalar, which is uh, appropriate for, conformal for the conformal coupling. And then you have to check what happens with these covariant derivatives. So uh, what is this? So this will be d mu minus i r times uh, a mu plus 3 half v mu. And then there is plus, so, mm, no, plus that. And then there is minus i v mu. So indeed, if r is equal to two thirds, this v mu cancels with this other v mu, and what you are left is the coupling to this a mu, which, as advertised, is the object which couples to the superconformal r, r current. So that this coupling you would expect even in conformal supergravity. So indeed, the coupling to v mu, which is the operator which has to uh, disappear, uh, does uh, disappear. And uh, you can also check this for the fermion that I leave you as an exercise. So is there any questions so far? So th the theory with the cubic superponential is classically superconformal. Well, okay, this is a free, we are considering a free chiral mass. Yeah, but, but you said the R to, to third. And I thought the motivation was. <laughs> yeah, so that, so if that, so that is the value which would correspond to, so, so you would expect for that value to be able to couple the theory to conform a supergravity. Be, be, uh, be because the, the superpotential... Because for that particular value, you could add a superpotential, which is... Yeah. So suppose I take R equal 1, then I, th I would be able to add a mass. So that is not the conformal value for the R charge. 
But if you include quantum effect, the theory is not really super conformal. If I include what? Quantum effect. Oh yeah, yeah. Then, right, then there is a question of like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm. Yeah, um, these are just classical considerations. So, presumably in the quantum theory, if there is, a, if there is a, yeah, uh, if the theory is not conformal because of quantum effects, then the coupling to be mu will reappear at one loop or higher loops. Um, okay, so. Now, are there any comments or questions? I have a, I have a quick comment. I, I yeah. So earlier, was there a question, I think, by Bruno about why the variation of S is a total derivative? Was, was there such a question? Yes. So I don't have a good reason. It's just easier, easy to write it that way. But, but isn't there intuition that generally when you want to write F terms in Lagrangian, you require that this I, I thought it was a general principle that the variation of the top component of the curve is equal to. Oh, okay, yeah, that may be true. That, yeah, that may be true. Uh, because that ensures that when you write F-term contributions to the Lagrangian, that they're supersymmetric. Um, right, except that I'm not. Com it's not a yeah, it's a well, but okay, you can still think. I mean, may maybe like if you can do all this in like actual curved superspace, you might be able to like show that that has to be the case. Uh, okay, so uh, I will want, how much time do I have? I have another half an hour, 40 minutes, okay. So, okay, so I will want to um, <coughs> give an example before going into more formal considerations. And uh, so this example will actually be also considered by Terashima and his lectures. So I can be glib, maybe. Um, or hopefully I will say things that uh, do not completely overlap with uh, what he's going to say. So, so the example I want to take into consideration uh, is that of uh, S3 times R. So that's a cylinder. So again, if you have a super conformal theory, then it's obvious that you can couple it, so you can put it on a cylinder preserving supersymmetry, because that's just a conformal mapping. Uh, but uh, uh, here we are trying to uh, find if this background is supersymmetric in the more um, less restrictive set of theories, which just have a U1R charge. Okay. So the isometry, the isometries of the cylinder, well, OK, there is the rotation of S3. That's an SO4. So there is SU2 left times SU2 right. So these are the two rotations of the S3, not to be confused with the frame rotations. I don't know, we can call them S2 plus and S2 minus, which corresponds to dotted and non-dotted indices in those equations. Okay, so there are two different set of SU2s. And then, uh, well, then there is R corresponding to the translation along the axis on the cylinder. <coughs> okay, so we would like to find a background which is uh, as symmetric as possible. So what uh, we, were, we are going to guess uh, that uh, because we don't have uh, a general uh, general procedure yet, so that uh, the auxiliary fields are going to be just uh, along the axis of the cylinder, which and we'll put a coordinate tau along the axis of the cylinder. So V is going to be little v times d tau, and the A is going to be little a times d tau. Okay, so now we can write down what those equations look like. And uh, okay, so if I've not done any mistake, um, okay, so I choose a frame which is adapted to the cylinder, so that means that uh, one one of the frames is just d tau. Uh, I mean, you could make a bad choice, and then your equation would be look very ugly, but we don't want to do that. And there is a similar equation 
with the opposite signs for zeta tilde. So this is along the time direction, and then you have in along the S3, you have some equation which looks like this. And uh, also here. Okay, so these are the equations that you have to solve. So now I'm not going to solve them, but uh, for exercise you can do it. Uh, but so the solution to this is okay, let's forget about this equation for a moment. Let's just look at this equation. So, well, if you're familiar with this kind of equation, it's clear that uh, the solution is, you're going to find solutions for V equals plus or minus I over R. And uh, this corresponds to uh, S2 right and S2 left invariant spinner on the sphere. Okay? So let's choose a sign, minus. And uh, so the solutions are going to be spinners zeta and zeta tilde that are invariant under uh, S2R. And vice versa, if I choose the other sign, then they will be invariant under S2 left. Um, so some comment, notice that the sign here in this equation is the same as the sign in this other equation. So both the zeta and the zeta tilde, one of which has undotted indices and the other one has dotted indices, but they are both S2 R invariant. So indeed, these two S2s have nothing to do with the other two. Uh, and uh, okay, so once you, once you have set what, so this you can check for uh, exercise. It's actually pretty easy. You just have to choose a I mean, if you choose the right frame on S3, then it's easy. You have to choose an S2R invariant frame. Uh, and then like, these equations become very nice. Uh, okay, so now let's look at uh, this other equation. And here it's clear that I have possible, different possible choices because any constant value for A will like, uh, give rise to a solution for zeta. Uh, it just changes how zeta depends on uh, the Euclidean time along the cylinder. Okay, so for instance, uh, I can choose a equals zero, and then if I choose a equals zero, I find that the commutator of h, which is the generators of translations along the tau, with the supercharge generated by zeta, let's call it q zeta, well, that will be equal to a half of um, of q so this is the case which corresponds to uh, the conformal coupling uh, of the theory to the cylinder indeed as we said before if for a conformal field theory all the couplings disappear except the one to a so if you set a to zero then that's exactly the conformal coupling that you know and love so this is the conformal coupling Uh, however, this is not maybe the nicest uh, value to consider. It's uh, nice to take A to be equal to I over Q. So this R is actually the radius of the S3. Uh, I guess maybe I should use a, let's call it L. Uh, and then with this choice, H commutes with Q and with q bar. So uh, an important comment is that uh, I really need the U1R symmetry to do this. Um, actually, if you look at this equation over there, and then you look at the old minimal equations that I brought uh, in the last lecture, or even at the beginning of this lecture, you might wonder that actually you can obtain the same 
by just, uh, you can obtain equations which look very much like this by just setting m to zero and just uh, having b mu in the old minimal equations. So in old minimal, you can indeed find uh, a solution on the cylinder exactly in the same way, but the difference there is that you don't have the freedom of adding the background gauge field for the U1R symmetry, and therefore you're stuck with uh, some commutator between the time translations and the supercharges. So in particular, it is impossible in old minimal to uh, add this uh, background uh, U1R gauge field in such a way that the supercharges are independent of time. And uh, when they are independent of time, then it's possible to compactify this uh, uh, cylinder on instead of being S3 times R, it will be S3 times S1, preserving supersymmetry. Well, if the supercharges are independent of time, this is clearly possible. So that means that uh, S3 times S1, so the compactified case, is only possible for theories which do have a U1 R symmetry. So this requires UNR. So in particular, say we take uh, super Young mills uh, this has no UNR symmetry because it's broken by an anomaly, and therefore uh, it cannot be placed on S3 times S1, uh, preserving supersymmetry. So you're saying that the, the Romanus Berger index requires R symmetry? Yes. So in particular, if you were to try to compute the Romansberger index for super Young mills I think you will find something, but the something cannot be interpreted as an index. Like the coefficients will just, I don't know, either be like negative or like not even integers. I actually don't know which of these things happens, but I'm sure one of these things will happen. <coughs> okay, so... Okay, so now let me uh, write down a little bit better what uh, the um, what the super algebra that results from this actually is. Hopefully, it's still slightly visible. Okay. So I'm going to be sketchy, but uh, you can check all these statements. Uh, by yourself, it's not too complicated. So let me introduce the following notations. So we have supercharges Q bar. Those are the ones which come from the zeta tildes. And uh, they have this index A, which is an index uh, under SU2L, uh, the left part of SU2. So these zetas uh, are invariant under SU2R, and they transform as spinors under SU2 left. So the, the corresponding supercharges will also be s 2 r invariant, but they will transform as spinors under s 2 left. So this A is an s 2 l index. And uh, then we'll have uh, QBs. Again, also the Qs transform under s 2 l And uh, this commutator ends up being h minus r over l times delta ib plus 2 over l j a b where j a b are the uh, generators of s 
SCTUL. Uh, and as we said before, QA, the queues will commute among themselves, and uh, uh, the same is the same will be true for the Q bars. <coughs> and uh, okay, I already said that uh, the Q bars and the queues transform as uh, doublets under S to left, but uh, let me skip this one. So then there is the R charge, and uh, so you can also check that uh, the supercharges have R charges. Uh, so this is for Q, and then there is another one for Q bar with the opposite sign. Then as advertised, we will consider the case where H commutes with Q. and it also commutes with Q bar. You can check that indeed the value of A, which makes uh, one of the, the A minus B disappear there, it also works for the other one. <coughs> okay, so the rest of the commutation relations are the one that uh, you would uh, know and love for, for SU2 left. Uh, so we can define J3 to be equal to J12, and then J plus will be equal to I times J11, and J minus is going to be I times J22. And uh, okay, so then you have the usual commutation relations. J3 with J plus minus is equal to plus or minus J plus minus, and uh, the commutator of J plus with J minus is equal to 2J3. Uh, and then you have commutators with the supercharges. I'm not going to write all of these, but for instance, J, pu, ah, J plus with Q2 is equal to minus IQ1, and uh, J3 with Q1 is equal to Q1. With Q2, it will have the opposite sign, and uh, J plus with Q1 is equal to zero, etc. So these are the just uh, saying that Q is a doublet under S2 left. So what is this superalgebra? Uh, this superalgebra has a name, and uh, it's uh, S2 slash 1, but uh, it is centrally extended by H. H indeed commutes with everything, and it just appears in the anti-commutator of Q with Q bar. Um, so if you consider the entire theory, supersymmetric field theory that you will write on the cylinder, this is going to have uh, a symmetry group which includes SU2 slash 1, but then it also has a U1 which corresponds to the translations along the cylinder, uh, or well, if you are in the non-compact case, I guess it would be R, and then there is another symmetry which is there for free, which is SU2R, because everything is independent of it. No supercharge. Oh, they're all singlets under S2R. Okay, so is there, yes? Wait, so in, in the product there. Um, yeah, this is not quite, uh, it's yeah. It's not a product. Yeah, this thing enters, yeah. It's like a semi-direct Yeah, it's a semi-direct Actually, it's in the product of 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 the Okay, so now the, the, uh, the other thing that uh, you can check uh, is that uh, if you were to put the theory in uh, Lorentz's signature, so at the time instead of being Euclidean would be Lorentzian, then you, could, uh, you would like to check that the theory is actually unitary. And it is, like, uh, because uh, when you change the, um, when you change signature, like uh, this, uh, uh, v and A will pick a factor of I, so they will get real. And then, indeed, uh, you can check what uh, the hermeticity conditions on the supercharges are going to be. 
And uh, so the hermetistic conditions on the supercharger which follow from the Euclidean continuation to uh, Lorentzian signature are just what you would expect, which is that Q bar A is the dagger of QA. Okay. <coughs> right, so now we can uh, study the representation theory of uh, this object. Are, are there any questions before I get into that? Okay, so if not, um, let's see what I can erase. Maybe I'll pull down this very up, upper. So the generator of that you want is H, right? Yeah. So then if you say it's a direct product, then it's not a simple extension. It's just no, what I'm saying is that H enters into the commutator of the Qs. That's not, so, but that's not a representation relation of SU2 slash 1. That's centrally extended by H. Yeah, it's not a product. That's uh, that, okay. Let's just erase it. It, 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 is, it is a product. Uh, it's abstract. It's abstract. The R symmetry you have to use just call it R tilde is R minus L H, and then you can call the you want generator whatever you want. But uh, it, it is a large product. Okay. H two slash one has different commutation relations. Period. It doesn't have H. Okay, we should talk about it. It doesn't have H. That's the difference. It's centrally extended. Yes, I agree. That's that. We sh I should erase this uh, this line. And but but the commutation relations are correct. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> okay. So now. Um, right, so now let's study uh, the representation of these guys. So. Because of the because the Q bar is anti-commute, we can just uh, choose an highest weight state which is annihilated by all the Q bars. So let's consider some state uh, which has uh, spin J and uh, R charge R. Uh, this is maybe not uh, the best. Uh, So and let's suppose that uh, this thing is uh, annihilated by all the Q bars, so by Q bar one and two. Right? But uh, then, from the commutation relation of the Q bars with the SU two left generators, uh, you can see that a commutator of a Q bar with J will only produce a Q bar. So that means that this condition is going to be true for all the uh, states in the multiples that you can obtain by acting with S2 on this, uh, on this state. So I can just take this to be the highest way state, and then all the other ones are going to be obtained by acting with uh, S2 left. So I have a bunch of states all annihilated by the Q bars, and uh, this will form an entire multiplet under, uh, under S2 left. So let's call this object J, which J is the top spin component and uh, R charge R. Um, so for instance, we have J plus on JR. Yeah, so maybe this we call, call M, and then this would be zero. And then all the other ones are obtained by descending. And this will form this uh, part of the multiplet. So, so far, I have not used the Qs yet. So now I can ask what happens if I take this uh, uh, multiplet, and uh, I act on it with Q. How do you define, how are you defining that? You're, you're imposing those equations, but then how are you defining J sub R? Yeah, J, J of R is like, so, so you take a state which is annihilated by all the Q bars. So those will lie in... So that's the state you're calling M comma R? Let's take uh, some state. Okay, so now, like, the comment is that because of the commutation relations with S2 left, then these states will lie in complete multiplets of S2 left. Okay, so then I can just choose one with a stop spin J. So we start with that state, and then the other ones here are, are obtained by acting on this state by S2, by, by J minus. 
Okay. Okay, so, but so far I haven't used the queues yet. So now I can act with Q. So what happens if I act on this multiplet with Q? So then uh, I will obtain two <coughs> complete multiplets, one uh, which has, uh, corresponds to J plus a half and R minus one, right? Because acting with Q lowers the R charge by one, but uh, uh, Q has spin half, so I will get two ones. So I also get the one with J minus a half and R minus one. Um, so actually I get both of, I don't get the second multiplet if J is zero. So this other, Multiplet I only get if j is greater or equal than a half. If j is zero, I only get the top one uh, just by following uh, additions of angular momenta. Uh, okay, and then like I can act with q again, and uh, and that will be it because uh, I only have q1 and q2, so I can act with both of them, and that gives me another complete multiplet, but with at spin j, but uh, with r charge r minus 2. Okay, so that's uh, the structure of a generic multiplet of this, uh, of this uh, super algebra. E now let's, uh, so now we can compute the norm of the highest weight states and uh, to check uh, conditions that uh, these charges have to satisfy in order for the multiplet to actually exist. So, um, so for instance, we can take, so wha what is the highest way state inside here? So the, st the state with top, uh, with highest spin. So that is clearly obtained by acting with Q1 on the top uh, guy here. So I can consider Q1 acting on JR, where J is the state, which is emulated by J plus. And then I can compute its norm. So this uh, you can do for exercise. And what you find out is that this norm is positive or equal to zero if H is greater or equal than R minus 2J. Then you can take the highest uh, state inside here. So that's a little bit more complicated because you have to construct it. So now it's, I mean, it's gonna have a piece which is gonna be given by Q2 acting on JR. Uh, but then this, I mean, you have to work a little bit harder to find out that uh, in order to find the state here which is annihilated by J plus, you have to add a piece uh, with uh, the following where Q1 acts on J minus one so here you have to take also the state which is the lowest, uh, which is obtained acting on J with J minus on JR, and then you have to act on that with Q1. So that gives the highest weight state here. And then you can, uh, so let's call this guy Psi. So the claim is that uh, J plus Psi is equal to zero. And uh, now you can compute the norm of Psi. and impose that it's greater or equal than zero. And uh, you find the condition that H has to be greater or equal than R plus two J plus two. Very good. So then the other thing that you can check is that uh, the last guy here has also positive norm. So that's easy because that's obtained by acting with Q1 and Q2 on JR. So I just check that the norm of this thing is positive. And uh, that gives uh, a further condition, uh, which when folded with this one, uh, just, uh, ah, okay, uh, there is a, I have to make a comment. So this, this condition uh, is clearly there only when this multiplet exists. So this is only there for J greater or equal than a half. So now you have to consider this guy and uh, when you fold it together, you find that it gives the same 
same, I mean, and you intersect that, you find that you get the same condition, but now it's also true for j equals zero. So again, this, okay, so to be, to be precise, this gives either h less or equal than r minus 2j, which however, like, is not compatible with the rest, uh, or h greater or equal than r plus 2j plus 2. Uh, but now this is also fine for j equals zero. Okay, so now you have found what the conditions are for the norms to be positive. So we can study the possible multiplets that, uh, that do arise. So what are these? So you have long multiplets. So the long multiplets are there whenever h is greater than r plus 2j plus 2. Uh, OK, so if j is greater than equal to a half, then the structure of the long multiplet is what we have above. So there is this plus j plus or minus a half at with uh, r charge r minus 1. And then there will be uh, j with uh, r minus 2. Uh, but there is also a long multiplet when j is equal to 0. And then you only have uh, jr and uh, j plus a half at r minus 1. Uh, oh, sorry, j is equal to 0. So we can just put 0 here, a half, and 0 at uh, r minus 2. So these are the long multiplets. So we can call this long j. Um, and then we have short multiplets. A and these arise when the norm of the states become 0. So when you saturate the bound. Uh, so for j, um, OK, so let's see, for j greater than a half, uh, you get uh, that uh, h. Sorry. Yeah, so h is equal to r plus two j plus two, uh, and then the multiplet contains j r and uh, j plus a half r minus one, but uh, not the rest. And uh, uh, instead, for j equals zero then h will be equal to 2 plus r. And uh, the multiplet contains 0 r and uh, a half r minus 1. So we we'll call these multiplets, which have the same structure, sj, uh, standing for short j. But then there is one final very short multiplet, which is just the singleton. So this happens for j equals r equals 0. And then the multiplet is just one state. And uh, we will call this as at. Five minutes. Oh, 12.30. All right. OK. Uh, OK, well, I think I can do it in five minutes. Uh, so we have the structure of the short multiplets. So now we can study how this. Uh, how it can be that short multiplets recombine into long multiplets. So suppose you have a long multiplet at spin j, and uh, now h uh, goes to uh, r plus 2j plus 2 from above. Then as the long multiplet hits the bound, uh, it splits into short multiplets, uh, and it becomes sj plus s j minus a half, um, with, the, with the corresponding r charges that you can find out because they are related. And, um, and uh, in the same way, when you have uh, L0, um, so sorry, so this was, for, this was for j greater or equal than a half. And then for the zero case, 
when h goes from above to 2 plus r, then this splits into s0 plus the singleton. Okay. So you would want to uh, construct some quantity which uh, counts uh, the short multiplets up to a combination. So that uh, is uh, an in some, some chance of being an index. So let's uh, build up the most general quantity we can imagine. So this will be a sum over all the spins of uh, some prefactors which can depend on the spin time the number of short multiplets as spin j. And then we can add uh, some other factor, let's call it beta, times the number of singletons. Sorry, but in order to, for a singleton to be contained in L0, you need particles to prove. Uh, the uh, singleton has zero departure. Yeah, but the singleton will be, the singleton will be the state here, right? So it will have zero charge. Ah, so it's inside this multiple? Yeah, it's, uh, it's out, so this multiple splits into these two, so that, this thing is the, so the long multiplet, which, okay, so this is, this long multiplet, the one at spin equals zero, it contains three pieces. So when R becomes equal to two, like this two become a short multiplet, and this becomes the single. Yeah, but your, your condition is not involve R being two. Yes, it does. Uh, uh, H has to, oh. Oh God. Uh, what did I do here? Pa, 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 pa. No, okay, so right. Right. So but 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 the but but the singleton will have the R corresponding to whatever it has to be. So, so you can have zero from zero each? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they can have non-zero each. Right. <coughs> Oops. So, okay, so now let's see what conditions. So we want this to be invariant under these uh, recombinations. So the first one tells us that uh, alpha j plus uh, alpha j minus a half uh, better be zero. And the second one tells us that alpha zero plus beta better also be zero. And uh, so the index that we get is, uh, we can erase this, put minus one to the 2j plus one. And uh, this we can just put to be one. And uh, that will be uh, our, our index. And uh, you can check that uh, this is the same as the trace of uh, minus 1 to the 2j3, or also called the trace of minus 1 to the f on your multiplets. Yeah, exponent, I'm having trouble reading, sum over j minus 1 to the minus 1 to the 2j3, or which is the same, 2j plus 2j3, okay. or which is the same in the trace of minus 1 to the f. Well, you can define f to be this. Um, okay, so now I'm done, uh, but uh, we'll continue with uh, comments about what this means uh, in the next lecture.